Good morning, Northminster, and welcome to our online worship service for today. Now, if you are watching this, check the clock really quick, because if it is 1130, it is time for our annual meeting, and I ask you to pause this video, jump onto the Zoom link, it's either down in the description below or in the weekly email, and join us for our annual meeting, where we look at how we did in 2020, hear reports back from a bunch of committees. I know for a fact that no one is on every committee, so it's helpful to hear what everyone's been up to this past year, and then we're going to take a look at where we are going from here. With this includes a budget discussion, you get a vote on a few contracts, so pause the video if it's 11.30. If it's before 11.30, I encourage you to keep an eye on that clock and be willing to jump over when it's time. I'll try to keep this worship service to uh, 45 minutes to make sure that everyone has a chance that after you watch the service to have like a little stretch break or to um, get a cup of coffee and then join us over on Zoom. If you are not a Zoom person, don't worry, I got your back. Zoom allows you to call in, so in the description there is also a phone number that allows you to dial in. Like a conference call, you will need the meeting code and the, and the password, but after that you can use any phone you want to call into the meeting, hear the discussion, and be able to vote along with everyone else. So I hope to see you all there at our annual meeting at 11.30 on Zoom or via phone. This upcoming week, we resume again our two studies. On Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock, we are continuing in our study of Matthew. Read Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 20. This is the beginning of the Sermon of the Mount and the discussion is going to be meaty because we're talking about the Beatitudes this week. So even if you haven't joined us yet and want to jump in on this Bible study, this is a perfect time to jump on and have a good discussion of what exactly Jesus is talking about when he says, blessed are. So I hope to see you all there. And then on Wednesday, we are continuing in our book study. Yes, we have con we have concluded our study on how to be an anti-racist, but we will be discussing The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. This is a short book, but it's a dense book, so we're going to be taking it chunk by chunk. So I invite you to read up to page 30 for this week, and we're going to discuss those first 30 pages. Because this month is Black History Month, and so as a part of that, we are reading James Baldwin's A Fire Next Time and continuing this hard and important discussion of racism both as it has been in history and what it means for us today and how we grow to be better to our siblings in Christ and our siblings in our wider community that may not have the same skin tone or skin color as us. So I invite you to join us either on Tuesday morning or on Wednesday morning or on both. They are both being held on Zoom at 10 o'clock. So I hope to see you there. So the sermon series that we are in right now, which has been a continuation of the Advent journey, wraps up next week. This week, we are finally launching into the story of the adult Jesus, the Christmas story and the infant Christ and the child Christ and even the 12-year-old teenage Christ is now turning into the story of Jesus Christ in his public ministry. So today is the transition point where we see the beginning of his ministry. Next week we are going to touch on a bit of his ministry and then we hit Lent. It starts with Ash Wednesday which is on February 17th. As we are still in the middle of this pandemic, we aren't able to have an in-person Ash Wednesday service. So what we're doing instead is Ashes to Go. For this, we are joining with Central Woodward and we're going to bless what I am calling Ash Wednesday packets. I am putting together packets that are including ashes so you can put them on yourself and I don't have to touch you. It's going to include communion, it's going to include sackcloth, and a small liturgy with just a few prayers and a little bit of scripture so you can celebrate Ash Wednesday with the entire community but in the safety of your all's homes. So, 
If you are wanting to pick up an Ash Wednesday packet, I invite you to stop by Central Woodward at 12.30 to 1 or stop by Northminster. I will be sitting by the sanctuary doors with the packets ready to go and passing them out from 4 to 5 p.m. on February 17th. I will be there. I hope to see you there. If you are currently not able, not willing, not comfortable coming out and driving and picking them up in person, I need to hear from you this week so I'm able to mail you a packet so that you will get it in time for Ash Wednesday. So I am more than happy to mail these out. I just need to hear from you. Send me an email and I'll get your address so you can participate as well in Ash Wednesday even if you are not leaving the comfort of your home. We're going to make it happen. So keep your eyes peeled. There will be a lot of information next week as we transition into the season of Lent. But for today, let us prepare our hearts and our minds to begin our worship service for today. Hear the good news of the psalmist's proclamation. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to God and the night is as bright as the day. The God who promised never to leave us or forsake us has come to us in Jesus Christ, who binds up the brokenhearted, heals all our infirmities, and relieves our burden of sin. So arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Let us worship God today. Oh, saints, we know not for saints, still yet. 
yet to be, for grace to bear true witness and serve you faithfully till all the ransomed number who stand before the throne ascribe to power and glory and praise to God alone. The scripture reading today is from Matthew 3, verses 1 through 4 and 13 through 17. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Northminster, will you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh upon us. Spirit of the living God, melt us, mold us, fill us and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us again today. Amen. I'm sure you all have had those moments those moments where you know there is no turning back now. Every person has at least one or two, if not a handful of these in their life, whether you knew it in the moment or whether you look back and you're like, yeah, there was no turning back from here. Some of these moments are first moments. The first time you picked up a drawing pencil or the first time you played an instrument and you're like, yes, yes, we have found it. Sometimes it is the first time you read that book that you are fully engrossed in and you have found your genre. Sometimes it's the, the first time you stood up for yourself. The first time that you decided like, yes, I am worth it. I'm going to do this thing. Or the first time you experience that thing and you know in that moment that that will be your thing forever on else and this is what you will spend your life doing. Sometimes the no turning back moments are some of the classic examples of the big things in life we celebrate. Things like marriage or having a child, buying a house, doing that big move. Or sometimes it is changing the job whether it's to something you have always wanted to do and you're finally able to do it, or whether you just need a life change. There are those moments where we have parties and because we want to celebrate that, yes, things are going to be different. No matter the outcome, things are going to be different from this point on. Sometimes the no turning back moment isn't, isn't as exciting or celebratory. Sometimes the no turning back moment is a diagnosis. Sometimes the no turning back is admitting that, yeah, there is a problem. 
and that you do need help. Sometimes the no turning back is when you're experiencing loss, whether it's the loss of a friendship, the loss of a loved one, or the ending of a relationship you held dear, and you admit that, yeah, things are going to be different from this point on. We all have moments where we cross thresholds. Sometimes we know that we are actively crossing a threshold. I mean, when you throw the party, the party is in some ways to celebrate that crossing of a threshold in a new chapter in life, as we love to say. Sometimes we only know that we've crossed that threshold in retrospect, and you're thinking back on how things went, and you're like, that was the moment now, and I recognize things were going to change. Repent, John says. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent is one of those loaded words. It should send off those red flags and warning signs that says, look me up, I have a lot to say. Repent in Greek is metanoio. I assume you're familiar with the prefix meta as we use it today as a shorthand for deep and complicated, very involved. And yes, it comes from the original Greek. Meta is to look deeply into, to be complex. Yes, those are in the Greek of meta. Noyo is understanding, to perceive. So together, metanoio is to perceive deeply, to look into, and to reconsider. But the texture of repent comes out even more in the Hebrew, teshuva. The root of the word teshuva is in the, is in the three characters, shuv. This word literally means to turn. If you're walking down a road and you shuv, you turn around the corner. Teshuvah, to repent, is literally just to turn around from the path that you were on. So John, we hear John saying, reconsider, look deeply into and turn around, for the kingdom of God is near. It's here. Look deeply around you. Reconsider what you're seeing. Maybe you should turn around. Reconsider the path that you're on. Because God, God's around you. So the theological question that comes up next often is, why does Jesus need to repent and be baptized? John is preaching the message of repent, the kingdom of God is here, and Jesus shows up saying, okay, baptize me. And the classic theological question is why? Because I am with you here. I subscribe to traditional Christian theology that says Jesus was without sin. What did he have to repent for? He was theoretically doing the work of God, right? He was sinless. It's kind of the whole point of the show. Why is Jesus showing up to John? And John seems to understand this too, because Jesus shows up saying, hi, baptize me. And John's like, ah, oh, hold up. Um, I think we got this backwards uh, because um, Jesus, you should be baptizing me. Um, having a bit of problem here. But Jesus insists, and John eventually capitulates and does baptize Jesus in the Jordan River. But while we hold that Jesus was sinless, that doesn't mean he didn't have to teshuva, to turn, to rotate, to pivot, to turn around, because guess what? The kingdom of God it was there. He knew it. 
maybe Jesus did need to turn to pivot to transition. What we can see by our scripture today, by the interaction of John and Jesus, is that they both had some notoriety at this point. It's in other Gospels that we have Jesus and John being cousins, but by just the Gospel of Matthew, we have no acknowledgement if John and Jesus knew each other on like a personal familial basis. But what is apparent is they definitely know about each other. Jesus knows about John enough to go to John hearing his message and says, okay, baptize me. John seems to understand who Jesus is enough to go, uh, do you have this backwards, Jesus? So they each were doing something that got them some amount of acclaim in first century Palestine. Granted, it was not the biggest world then. If people were stirring up trouble, you tended to hear about it, but there, it means something was going on. They knew about each other. But the thing is, we have no record of what Jesus was doing up until this point. After we get Jesus in the temple, there's just a bunch of years of silence. We don't know what Jesus was up to, even if he did have some sense of notoriety, if people kind of knew who he was. This moment with John the Baptist is a turning point for Jesus. It's a moment of transition. Because what we find in this story is this marks the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. We estimate that Jesus went around Galilee and eventually to Jerusalem and preached for about three years. But his ministry starts here. His public ministry that we have record of starts with John the Baptist and Jesus' baptism. So whatever Jesus was doing before this point, yeah, he did need to turn around. Maybe not turn like a 180 and go the other direction, but he definitely had a moment where he's like, okay, now is the time to pivot what I am doing. To turn and make this ministry of mine public. To start doing the thing and going down the path which there will be no return from. Let's start preaching and teaching and healing and challenging people. Let's start to do the thing. Let's pivot. So yeah, in baptism, Jesus is crossing this threshold. He is shuving. He is teshuva. He is turning. This is the threshold of the beginning of the story of Jesus' ministry. But the thing about transition points of the no going back moments is actually they're quite arbitrary. I think it's actually one of the reasons why we create rituals around certain parts in, in life. The joy of having the wedding ceremony and the big party is to mark the point where, yes, this is gonna be different from now on. The baby showers and all of the celebrations that go before a child is born celebrates that your life is going to be forever different. Like, even if it's not your first kid, like, things are still about to change. And it's the importance of funerals to say that, yes, life has permanently changed, gives that tangible moment of pivoting from one point of life to another. But in all of these cases, there has been a buildup. The birthday parties where we, we bring the, <laughs> we say people are over the hill. It's not that life immediately changes. It's the pinpoint where we get to acknowledge the transition, acknowledge the change that's happening to both celebrate and acknowledge what is going on, what is changing in our world. Jesus comes out of the water ready for a public ministry to step into that Messiah role that he's been building up to for a while now. And God says, yes, 
This is my son who I'm well pleased with. This pandemic in many ways has acted for all of us as one big transitional moment. We can look back and pinpoint the moment where everything changed. It was nearly overnight. It was actually rather jarring, but we've had this trend continued transitional moment. But one of the harder parts, at least for me, has been the evaporation of a sense of time. The days all seem to blend together and yet the months evaporate. I am still slightly in shock that it is February right now. Holidays and normal celebrations have kind of just passed by without much mention. Birthdays and graduations have come. Some of them have been celebrated in altered ways, but some of them have occurred in deflated, anticlimactic ways. I know hearing about my brother-in-law who graduated from college and it was minimal fanfare and it is almost defeating for these major transitions to happen with a kind of splat. Where normally we would have big wedding showers or baby showers, we've moved them online with everything else. Some people have done things like drive-bys, but it doesn't have that same weight. I know that there are so many weddings that have been postponed, other ones that have happened in smaller sizes, and I, far too many people haven't been able to have that moment of grief because funerals have even been postponed, hoping that later on we could have memorials with more people. In other cases, like everything else, the funerals have moved online, but it doesn't have that weight of change, of transition, of those moments where you come to realize that, yes, things are going to be different. But what has been interesting is seeing new rituals develop. Most strikingly that I've seen in the past few weeks is a new ritual of people posting pictures of themselves online of getting vaccination, the vaccination, like literally as the needles in them or the picture of their card in celebration that yes, their life is changing. Things are going to be different from this point on. There's more freedom with the vaccination. As a whole, we are beginning to surface from the watery chaos that has been now almost a year, where time feels nebulous, where a lot of ritual markers have just evaporated, holidays just flown by, weeks melded together, having the months zoom by. We were forced to halt in our tracks. We shooved hard. We turned around from the path that we were in and it wasn't even really our choice to stop and turn on a dime but we did it with the promise that the kingdom of god is near yes we turned a hard turn trusting that god would help us on the bank of it and would be with us along the way and we have navigated this turning point together. I, from the depth of my heart, want to thank you at this kind of one year marker of us doing ministry together for the trust that you have put in me to on a dime bring us online, to change how we do church. I thank you for the work that you all have put in, for the journey with me along here. I feel like this has been a partnership of trust, both as we have navigated uncharted territory, both for me and for Northminster as a whole. Trust me, I didn't know how to do this a year ago fully. This is new, but thank you. Thank you for your trust as we shuv together. And we have teshuvad. We have turned. But we are also doing a much slower teshuva now. I know many of you are frustrated and stuck in a sense of timelessness. 
it's one of the more frustrating aspects of being in lockdown. This sign here, I brought it over from another part of my house. This has been up since March. When we first went into lockdown, I thought it would be funny to change the board to this message. And I haven't changed it since. I used to change it with the seasons with a funny saying when I could think of it, but that's been the same since March. There's a weird sense that even in the holidays, we're st I've still been in these same walls. The weekends and the weeks, I work in the same place that I relax. This timelessness, it eats at you. It's hard, it's difficult. And I know there are certain aspects of, of, of people's lives that are changing. People are getting vaccinated. We have some of our youth that are returning to school. We have other people that are returning to in-person work. Things are shooving, they are turning. But together as a community, we are emerging from the waters of chaos. We're going to have to teshuva again, but we're going to do it together. Hopefully this time it'll be a bit slower and not have to pivot on a dime like we did last year in March. But I also promise you that where we are right now is not forever. It may be frustrating to hear that yet another big congregational event is happening on Zoom with everything else. And some of you don't have access to that, and that's just not a thing that is a viable form of communication. I hear you. We will return to in-person. But I also have a sense that this right here is making another pinpoint marker, an origin story of sorts, of where our community has pivoted to a new chapter it has been a dramatic pivot, yes. But this is also beginning a new story of Northminster and how we're going to adapt in the modern world. We needed to teshuva anyways. This has just given us a dramatic entry of sorts. So as we teshuva together, as we turn Know that the kingdom of God is here. Look around you, look deeply, because God is in the works. And as we emerge from this watery chaos, listen for God saying, yes, this is my beloved community, whom I love, and I am well pleased. Thanks be to God. Amen.
rose, set your heart on things above. Soon the Lord will come in power, when he cleanse the threshing floor. Then we'll fling the chaff till hour. Meet all shall fill God's with such preaching stark and bold, John proclaimed salvation here, and his timeless warnings hold, words of hope to all who hear. So we dare to journey on, let my faith through ways untrod Till we come at last like John To behold the Lamb of God Let us pray. God of creation and redemption, your prophet Isaiah reminds us that you have established the heavenly host and invite us to lift up, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. We thank you for this assurance of your strength and power. You have created all things and continue to sustain them. You also come into our present moment, our times of vulnerability and trial to renew our strength, and for this we are thankful. Yet we acknowledge, O oh God, that the realities of the pandemic weigh heavily upon us, upon our children, upon our nation, and the entire globe. Our crisis feels like an exile because we are living with profound isolation and deep vulnerability. Teach us, O oh God, that standalone self-sufficiency is an illusion and it is not your will for us. Help us to discern our deep interdependency with one another and with you. Help us to trust in the comforting words of the prophet Isaiah that remind us that you give power to the faint and strengthen the powerless and that, that those who wait on you shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. These words affirm that you, O oh God, can make a way when there appears to be no way. Thus, we continue to pray for weary healthcare workers in the trenches of this pandemic and for all who are now facilitating vaccinations. We pray for your comfort for all who are sick and for all who have lost loved ones. Empower us to be agents of love and justice for all who are suffering in our midst. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah.
If you all notice, I held back from using the word repent a lot. It's because I feel like the word repent has a lot of baggage that it brings with it. And it doesn't, the way it is used in some Christian circles, doesn't actually reflect the original meaning, which I actually quite love. To turn, to teshuva, the modern Christian church is in need of teshuvain, to pivot, to look deeply around us. And I think we all knew that. We just didn't know what it looked like. And it's sometimes hard to teshuva when you don't know which way to turn, even if you're promised that the kingdom of God is here and God will be with you. This pandemic is, has been a forced Teshuva. It has been a for forced turning. There has been things that we have been forced to do. We have crossed those thresholds and there is no turning back from where we are now. As I have been saying over and over again, we are different than where we were a year ago. And yes, a year ago. Like I said in the sermon, I am so honored and so touched that it has been a year and you all have trusted me through this teshuva. That we have worked together to build up a ministry that I, I personally am proud of and I hope you are too. We look at Jesus' story and we see this week that there are different points in his life. There is the Advent story, the true origin story of Jesus, where we celebrate his birth and everything that had to come together for God to be incarnate in this world. We see all the stories of how he is working in both his tradition and his understanding and transitioning those into his own ministry. And here we see him turn, pivot, his personal life, his learning into a public ministry where there is no going back for Jesus. We, Northminster has had a public ministry for many decades now. We are working to incorporate where we've been and the traditions we uphold. And now we're in a moment where we are turning, we are pivoting, we have crossed that threshold into a new point on the journey. Teshuva, the kingdom of God is here. It is here. It is online with us. It is in Troy, Michigan. It is in our buildings. It is in our homes. The kingdom of God is 
with us. And we have seen the full power of just where here is, that we're no longer confined to the building, that we have avenues that don't cost us much money to spread this message of hope and healing and God's love in our community. We are Teshuvain, and we are emerging from the watery chaos of this year. Remember that water is present in creation. God hovers over the waters. And in baptism, there is this recreation, this return to the waters, this pivot. And in here we see Jesus return to the water to pivot to public ministry. And it's a call to us again to, yes, pivot our ministry for the kingdom of God that is working in our world today. We're not forever going to be in lockdown. We are not forever going to be worshiping in our homes. We are teshuvahing together. Things are changing. There, we will return together and we are going to have a celebration to mark that re-entry back to ministry in person. We are going to celebrate it. We're going to mourn what we lost. We are going to have these big moments and ritualize them so we can pinpoint these transition points. But know that yes, the world is turning. The kingdom of God is already here. Let us continue for another year of work, of trusting God. Trust in God's love. Trust in each other for continued ministry where we rely on each other. Have faith in each other. And have faith in God that yes, God will be with us as we cross these thresholds and pivot our community together. God has made the journey ahead. That journey is not necessarily a straight road. It does have curves in it. And if we're going to journey with God, that means sometimes we do need to shuv and teshuva and turn with God. But Jesus himself calls us forward, knowing the path has those moments of turning, having navigated those turns himself. And it is the Spirit that guides us when we need to pivot and turn in our life. Thanks be to God. Amen.